I don't know why you came today. Maybe to get a coffee. Maybe to see a friend. Maybe uh, to worship the Lord. Hopefully, at least the last one. We've come here today to uh, to meet together, to center ourselves around the person of Jesus, to lift up His name, to explore His Word. So will you stand with us and let's do that right now. Let's lift up the name of Jesus together.
Amen. It's good to lift up the name of Jesus with you, to worship him together. His banner over us is love, it says, and um, his love is just an amazing thing to grasp. I think if we could let it sink in, if we could understand it fully, then we would absolutely be moved to a place of worship this morning. And Paul was trying to do that to the churches in Rome when he was explaining the love of God in the gospel. He says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God. <laughs> Sometimes in moments like this, you just got to stop. There's a big bang. You stop. You regather yourself. Funny things happen. I'll let her get set up. Here we go. Do I have your attention now? <laughs> it's okay. We can laugh at it. That was funny. Good job, Amanda. You did great. Nice recovery. Okay. Where were we? The love of God. Let's bring ourselves back into it. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, we celebrated just a couple weeks ago who was raised, who was at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long, we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen? The love of God is an amazing thing. Let's grasp it right now. Let's be more aware of it than we were, and let's put him on, on the throne of our lives because of his love for us. Not because we're lovely and lovable, but because he is so amazingly gracious and loving. Let's sing this song to him. got a friend closer than a brother there is no judgment oh how he loves me I've got a friend and he is my strength and he is my portion with me in the valley, with me in the fire, with me in the storm. Let all my life testify. The cross it is spoken 
Like a ring of solid gold Like a vow that is tested Like a covenant of old Your love is enduring Through the winter rain Beyond the horizon With mercy for today Faithful you have been yourself to me and it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be
wonder at the love you have for us. We are amazed at the power that you have to make heaven and earth, to make stars, and to hold everything in the palm of your hand. And then, in the other hand, lovingly to reach out to us and to take our sin away and to clothe us in righteousness, to bring us into your family. Thank you, God, that you are both of those things. Thank you for your love. We praise you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. You may be seated. If you came in wondering if God loves you, I hope that after that set that the worship team presented to us and um, lifted us to the Lord that you feel loved by him now because you are loved and we're glad that you're here. Welcome to Cornerstone. We are a church family building great families. If you are newish, we have mugs in the back there on the table and that is a gift to you to thank you for being here. We have a potter in our church, so they're handcrafted and beautiful. And you can, there's a note in there, a little card, next step card, and you can just fill that out and let us know your information, and we'll just let you know that we're here available for you for whatever your needs are. You can drop that in the back at guest services. Or if you're just wondering about your next step in the Lord, there's a next step card right in front of you. And if you have any questions or 
any concerns, just know you can just pop that in the box in the back and you will be um, lifted to the Lord in prayer and we'll try to contact you and let you know that we love you and care about you. Um, this week, this month is Child Abuse Awareness Month. And so I'm going to ask Megan to come forward and share with us her ministry at Mountain Star and how we can be involved as a church. And I saw the box is almost already full. So we got to, you know, we got to win, church. This is, we're, we're doing really good. I mean, we're kind of a big deal. Yeah. So <laughs> no pressure, but it's, it feels good to win. No, I'm just kidding. Um, good morning. Um, you know, our, our tagline, our mission is a church family building great families. And I feel like um, Mountain Star just goes right along with that. I've been blessed for the last few years to be able to volunteer. And um, when I say volunteer, I go in and play with babies once a week. So it's not really hard work, but it's pretty amazing. Um, and so I just wanted to tell a few things about the program. It's a really unique organization, um, especially because the goal is prevention, which uh, is pretty unique. And so they really try to focus on families that, number one, have to volunteer to be in the program. They don't necessarily search out families. Families have to come to them, which is really amazing because there's just a lot of buy-in that way. Um, and they provide all kinds of services. They connect them with other services. Their goal is really to meet those families in crisis before abuse can kind of take root in their homes. And um, they're just families that are vulnerable for a lot of different reasons. Maybe they are struggling with unemployment, uh, substance addiction. Uh, maybe they are just you know, struggling to make ends meet. Um, maybe they're victims of abuse themselves and so need some counseling services in that regard. So they really try to meet families where they are and provide them with services to prevent abuse from starting in their homes. And they have a preschool, they have um, a toddler age, they have babies come in once a week, they do home visits. Um, so it's really a fantastic, fantastic organization and I, I, like I said, I'm very blessed to be able to be there um, the teachers are very caring, very compassionate. They, um, I had to kind of learn, you know, not to say no. It's more just, you know, gentle hands. Everything's very gentle because oftentimes their homes are so chaotic and filled with a lot of um, just chaos that everything's very calm and those women are, are they're really amazing. Um, another thing that's really important in our church is food. We love food in this church. And so they do make homemade meals. They have a homemade breakfast. They have a homemade lunch. And so that in itself, I think, is, is pretty amazing. Um, and so a couple things were, yes, collecting diapers, which is great. Um, they also, gas cards, you know, gas is on the rise. Gas cards are great. Grocery Safeway cards are amazing. Um, sunscreen, if the, if the weather ever changes, they're outside a ton because um, they oftentimes are living in very small apartments or trailers, and so um, they, they do spend a lot of time outside playing, which is great. Um, and then also, their website, like Kim and I were talking, is very, very user-friendly. Not all are, but if you go to their website, you can just read a lot about their mission statement, and they have a wish list. And it's nice because it's um, specific to Madras or Lapine or any other facility in Central Oregon. So you can go and it'll have a wish list of things that they might need for that season. And they also, Mona and I have talked a lot about, they have a fairy godparent program, which um, I think is great. I'm a godparent to one of the uh, little babies in one of the classes. And so the teacher will contact me every once in a while and say, hey, this family needs uh, a winter coat. Could you provide that, um, a gas card? Um, and, it's, and that's nice because there's no minimum or maximum value on things. It's just kind of an as-needed basis. And so you're really supporting that family in that way. You can come and actually meet that child if you choose to, or you can just remain anonymous. So they have a lot of ways for you to get involved um, if you don't just want to show up there and play with babies, which also is super fun. So. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. And like I said, diapers are expensive, I know, but 
you know, we like to win, so if you can provide <laughs> anything. They, they actually very greatly appreciate everything, so thank you so much. You stay right here for just a second. Okay. I asked, I asked Jeff if we could have a fairy godchild, and he said we have eight needy children, <laughs> yeah. grandchildren, so, well. but I still think we might need to adopt a Let's child. One more. What's yeah. one more? What's one more? Come on. Right, right. <laughs> So I just want to thank you, Megan. She really represents Jesus Christ and Cornerstone up at Mountain Star. And when I've, when I've emailed the big corporate office in Bend, they're like, oh, we hear so many good things about Megan. So thank you for representing Jesus. And I just want to pray with you. Yeah, thank you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Megan just shining her light for you in this place where these children just need a touch of Jesus. And she is that to them. I thank you that she represents you well and enhances your reputation in our community. I just pray you would bless her as she continues to be there week after week, year after year. And I pray that we would be um, a church that makes a huge difference and impact in the lives of children in Central Oregon. In Jesus' name, amen. amen thank you. Yep. Okay, Cornerstone Kids can be dismissed for the new Orange program, which I heard is just... Awesome. So have fun, kids. All right. All right. Oh, exciting stuff. Good morning. I invite you to turn to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. I believe that what we get to look at out of Daniel chapter 9 this morning is really current front page news so I was watching the Masters tournament yesterday I know I know some of you are like you're watching golf isn't that boring well I watch golf because it gives me hope okay seriously I watch these professionals and they hit it and it goes that way into the bunker or whatever and it makes me go hey I'm not that bad these are professionals and then I watch how they just effortlessly swing the club and hit the ball, and I'm thinking, I can do that. So it gives me hope, at least until the next time I go out on the course, and then I realize I'm still miserably bad. So anyway, I was watching the Masters, and all of a sudden, a news break came in, you know? They interrupted the program, and this news break came in, and you've probably already heard this, but, but the person behind the desk said, I ran has attacked Israel and they were sending in these drone uh, strikes and and uh, and it had started and so the whole thing with the Gaza Strip that's been going on the last several months now is just kind of escalated and and uh, it's very intriguing to me because as those news reports concerning Israel come as the years have gone on I know that there are many people who are greatly concerned, not just politically, but even more so prophetically. God's people are the Israelites. They still are. I believe it. And we're called to pray for them. We're called to uphold and pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And I do. And so when these things happen, we know it's, it's a part of prophecy. Now, I can't tell you today exactly what it means that Iran has attacked Israel. I cannot give you that. I don't know. But I do know this, that in light of all that conflict going on right now, that today we are one day closer to the end times than we were yesterday, okay? I can guarantee that. We're one day closer, for sure, end of discussion. And so as you think about that, as you think about the Bible and the prophecy that is in the Bible, I have a question for us this day. How do we respond? No, let me ask it this way. How do you respond to Bible prophecy? And I've been around enough to know that there are several ways that people respond. The first is some are apathetic toward it. Some just are, they don't, they don't want to go there. Some are, uh, they do that because they're fearful. It's like, oh no, th this is really something, this is true. And, and, and instead of facing the reality that God is sovereign and he's working out his plan and the end times are coming, they want to just bury their head in the sand and, and not be afraid. Others are apathetic because they think wrongfully that prophecy and in their thinking, just like doctrine, it divides. 
You know, people have their different ideas of end times and it just divides us. So why give ourselves over? So some are apathetic. There are others that are allured by it. They just want to know about it. They want to hear about it. It's this shiny light that they're drawn to, right? I, I went fishing on Friday and, uh, and the guy I went fishing with, he was given this lure to try out. I, I'd never seen anything like it. It was this little fish. It looked like a fish. It had hinges and it was battery operated. So seriously, it had a little propeller on the front as soon as you put that thing in water, it would start swimming. It was the, I mean, we were sitting there watching, we had more fun watching that than catching fish, especially because we didn't catch very many. But anyway, it was pretty amazing. And, and supposedly the idea is that that would lure fish to, to bite it. Well, some people see prophecy that way. It's that lure. It's that, uh, you know, it's almost like a, a, a horror movie that they can't stop watching. You know, they hear about the beasts. They hear about, uh, you know, the, the little, little horn with the eyes and the mouth that boasts arrogantly. And they hear about the dragon and all those things in Revelation. And it's that horror story that they just can't stop watching. Others study and study and study it, and they actually become puffed up because of it. They know everything. Just ask them. They'll tell you. And they, they just know everything about prophecy, and they will let you know how, not only the past history and how that's worked into prophecy, but they will tell you, here's the next thing that's going to happen, and here's how Iran attacking Israel is fitting in. And they know everything, which is great, but it goes to their head, and they become super puffed up. And then there are those who are like that, that in that arrogance become argumentative. And they start, they really do divide. And they start hearing other people with their different views and different interpretations. And they start arguing and debating and, and going after them. And, and honestly, churches and people have divided over end times things because there's been debate and argument. And then there are people who are aloof. And I don't mean aloof to prophetic things. I mean aloof to what's going on around them because of prophecy. You've probably seen those people. It's said about them that they are so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good. And that's what I'm talking about. Those people that are so into prophetic stuff and they think they believe like I do, God, uh, the Lord's coming back any time. And so what do they do? They sit in their chair, they put it on cruise, and they don't worry about telling people about Jesus. They don't worry about learning about Jesus more and growing in their relationship with Jesus. They're just counting the time. Okay, it's coming soon. I'm just going to sit back and relax. Some have actually sold things and gone to the top of a hill thinking he's coming back. And that's what I'm talking about. Some are aloof to what's going on here on this earth. But the question is, how should we respond? Prophecy is given to us for reasons. And, and, and one of the ways that, uh, or one of the things we should be asking when we look at prophecy is, how do we respond to this? In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel is given two sets of prophecies. One he reads about, and one an angel comes and shares it with him. And the second part, the last four verses are what I, I want to get to, and I want to share with you my conviction on that. Now different people have different understandings of that, and that's okay. But again, you remember I'm right, okay? They're wrong. No, I'm joking. But, but I want to share that with you. But as we do, I want us to focus in. How does Daniel respond to these prophecies that he comes to realize and understand because I think it says this is how we should as well. So with Bibles open to Daniel chapter 9, let me pray and we will dive in. Father, we need you. This stuff is not easy. It's not easy to, to, to uh, teach and, and I, I pray that uh, you would help me be clear in my words that you would communicate through me that there would be clarity of, of that, of your word. And that, Father, we would be intrigued by the things that you have done in fulfilling prophecies and the things that you will do as you fulfill your words to us. But, Father, even more than that, I pray that you would help us to respond the way you want us to respond today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if prophecy is not given to us so that we can sit back and, and take it easy or so that we can kind of study it and kind of go googly-eyed about it or become arrogant or argumentative about it or, 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 or that we just hide 
our head in the sand. What should we do with prophecy? And so we start in Daniel chapter 9, and and we come to verse 1. And what we discover is in the first three verses, Daniel discovers that that prophecy is near fulfillment. Oh! And what do you do about that? So let's stop. Let's, let's look in. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 1. It begins like this. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, uh, by descent of Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. So what we know is the time frame. Daniel has been in captivity in Babylon for 67 years. He was the first group to go in from Jerusalem. 67 years. Daniel at this time is probably in his mid-80s. He was taken in when he was a teenager boy, and now he's probably mid-80s. This has been a time where Babylon has been overtaken by the Medo-Persian Empire, and so that's why Darius is now the ruler. So we know the time. But here's what I love. Verse 2, Daniel at 85 has not stopped doing his quiet time with the Lord. Isn't that cool? I grew up, and honestly, I grew up in church, and I got kind of tired of hearing people say, you need to read the Bible every day. You need to read the Bible every day. You need to read the Bible every day. And as a kid growing up in church, when I got to my teenage years, I had heard that so much. It was so cliche-ish. It just kind of didn't mean anything. So it's really cool when you turn to a, a verse in the Bible and you see somebody actually exemplifying it who is in their older age still reading the Bible. And so here's Daniel Chapter uh, 9, verse 2, it it says this, Daniel, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah, the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely, 70 years. So here's what he's come to discover. In Jeremiah, the prophet, God reveals how long the nation of Israel is going to be in captivity there in Babylon. 70 years. Now, you remember when I said he had been in Babylon for 67 years? (laughs) The fulfillment of this prophecy is knocking at his door. And so what does he do? He sits back and waits those three years. No. He starts to gain more insight and knowledge and starts holding seminars and charging people to come in and hear his expertise, expertise knowledge and what's going to happen in the next three years. No. He debates. No. No. What does he do? Verse 3. Oh, I'm going to skip this real quick because I'm, I'm I ran out of time in first service, so I'm going to skip this. Here's what he does. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Daniel prays. He prays. I love it. One of the first things you and I should do when we hear and discover more about the prophetic word in the Bible is we ought to be compelled, propelled to pray. That's what we ought to do. One of the responses we should have is prayer. And Daniel prays. He seeks the Lord. In the next verses, verses 4 through 15, he he is praying. And verse 16 is his request. And and I just want to take us through. We're going to go through very quickly here. We're not going to dive in, but I'm going to give you an outline to look at, okay? So here's the outline for verses uh, 4 through 19. First of all, we notice in this prayer that Daniel starts with praise. He starts with praise. And so verse 4, we read, I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, and listen, great, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commands. He goes vertical. What's our first thing we want to do when we pray oh god give me give me give me oh lord help me help me help me oh lord my loved one is hurting take care of them make it all better for them we request first i love it that daniel praises god first 
He exalts God for who he is. Same thing that Nehemiah will do years later as he goes in and rebuilds the wall of Jerusalem. Before he goes, he prays, and he starts off with praise to God in his prayer. And I love it. I would say to you, that's what we need to do first, and it's what we need to weave through our prayer time with the Lord. Daniel does it. He says, uh, he, he, he goes on in verse uh, 7, he says, To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness. Verse 9, to the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness. He just upholds the name of the Lord and exalts him and praises him throughout his prayer. But mostly this prayer is a prayer of repentance because it's done in sackcloth and ashes, says verse 3. And so we have a lot of confession. And what's unique here, what's interesting here, is Daniel includes himself. It's not they blew it, they sinned, they were terrible, they were miserable. It's all we and us and we and us. Daniel includes himself, even though he's probably the most righteous person in the nation of Israel at that moment, he still realizes he has a long way to go. He has messed up too, and so he includes himself. With things like this in verse 5, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. And he just goes on and says, we've done this, we've done this. The prophets told us, your, your messengers told us, but we would not listen. We disobeyed and we disobeyed and we disobeyed until verse 11. He concludes all together and says, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. And down through verse 15, the rest of it, Daniel is saying, we're getting our just desserts. We have sinned. You are righteous. You are holy. You are right. You are true. You are mighty. You are the awesome God. And compared to you, we have blown it. And we're getting what we deserve. And so he confesses. I would submit, anytime you pray to the Lord, confess. Confession means I come alongside with God and I agree about my sin with him. I'm just going, yep, Lord, that was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. That's confession. It needs to be a part of prayer. But then he pleads, he, he requests at the end. And what's amazing to me is his request in verses 16 through 19 is not for him or for his people. He's not saying, oh, bless us, Lord. Oh, bring us back into the land and make us profitable again. Oh, Lord, make the people be uh, bowing down to us. No, his prayer is really one, and his request is one, that Jerusalem be rebuilt, and especially this, the temple of God be open again so that sacrifices to the one true living God could take place again. And so he says in verse 16, Oh, Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because of our sins, for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. And verse 19 says, O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own name's sake. Oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. What's amazing is he all, he, he's requesting the glory of God. I want your city and your temple to be restored again so that your name will be glorified among the nations. That's what he's praying. That's his request. And so I would encourage us that the first thing we ought to do when we hear of Bible prophecy is we ought to get on our knees. We ought to praise God for who he is. We ought to confess our sins and even the sins of our peeps. And we had a request that him, that he receive glory in no matter what is about to happen. That should be our prayer. But there's another thing that takes place here. Another thing that happens. Now in his prayer, Daniel is met by an angel. And the second thing I want us to see, the second response we ought to have is prophecy ought to propel us not just to prayer, but to prepare. We should be propelled to pray for sure, 
But we should be propelled to be ready when we hear of Bible prophecy. And so what happens is in the middle of his prayer, Daniel is interrupted. Can you imagine that? He hasn't even finished his prayer yet, and God has already sent somebody to answer his prayer. Woohoo! I love that. Too many times we have people complaining, I've prayed and prayed and prayed and God hasn't answered, God hasn't answered. Well, here, even before the prayer is over, God answers. And so he comes to Daniel and we read this, verse 20, while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sins of my people Israel and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, While I was speaking in prayer, notice, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. Let's stop there for a second. Let's talk about the who. The who is Gabriel. Gabriel shows up. We know he calls him a man, but we know that he flies in. We know that he's an angel based on uh, what other passages of Scripture say. In fact, he's one of three known archangels in scripture he is he is gabriel the archangel uh michael is one who does god's bidding he's like the master beater upper dude he's the he's the bouncer guy and then there is gabriel who's the messenger and there is a third archangel whose name was lucifer now we know him as satan because he in his pride got puffed up and got kicked out of heaven by the Lord. And so we have these as known written in in the word of God. And here's Gabriel. He's the messenger sent by God. And when Gabriel shows up, you can guarantee that it's going to be a message concerning Messiah. He shows up here. He'll talk to Zacharias, who becomes the father of John the baptizer. But he tells him, your son is going to pave the way for Messiah. And then guess who talks to Mary, letting her know that she's going to have Messiah? Gabriel. And so here is Gabriel. He's going to give now Daniel this message. And he starts by wanting Daniel to understand, which is good for me to hear, because often I think prophecy is so hard to understand. But Gabriel is sent so that Daniel will understand. And so it says, uh, he made me understand, speaking with me and saying, O Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. That's why I prayed that the Lord would do that for us. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Now, the last four verses are the vision. Are you awake? Do we need to get up and do any calisthenics or anything to get blood going again? Because when we get into these four verses, it's going to go... Some of you have studied this. Some of you have already understood it. Some of you could probably teach it much better than I can. And so I'm going to do my best to help us see what's going on here. And I I have a chart that I want us to see. In fact, by the way, I forgot to mention, I meant meant to say at the beginning, uh, the chart is actually on half sheets on that table where the cups are. So if at the end you want to grab some, or if you want to even do it now, I don't mind, um, you can grab that and have that chart for your reference. But, But as we get into verse 24, we see this, this new vision, this new prophecy. And so as we do, let me get there to verse 24. It says, Gabriel goes on and he says, 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression and to put, let me stop right there. (laughs) We're going to take this chunk by chunk to make sure we get it. Now notice what's different. Jeremiah's prophecy said 70 years. Gabriel says 70 weeks. Now that means 70 sets of weeks. Or if you understand that the Jewish calendar, the Jewish number seven, was incredibly important, that that everything went off the number seven, what this is saying is 70 sevens of something. Okay? And what we come to understand is this means 70 sets of seven years. Okay, you with me? 
Have I lost you? Do we just need to go home now? 70 weeks, or 70 sevens of years. 70 times seven. Let's just get there. We're talking 490 years. Does that make sense? Okay, I should have said that at the beginning. Some translations actually say that. They say 490 years. And uh, this is more in line with what the actual uh, words say in the original. Uh, So that's why it's this way. But we're talking 490 years, but it works out to be 70 sets of sevens. Okay, that's important. Because it goes on and it explains a little bit more. But notice what's going to happen at the end of this 70 sets of seven years. The verse says right here, to finish the transgression. I'm going to put it in a different way. To finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, to anoint a most holy place. Now, Scholars debate. Here's where we get into debate. Scholars debate. How many of those have been fulfilled? And I will tell you, I see only one in its truest form. Only one. You see which one I'm talking about? The atonement for iniquity. Jesus has already come. He has died on the cross for our sins, paying the penalty for our sins so that we have atonement for our sins. And by his resurrection, we, have, we can have a relationship with the one true living God. Atonement for sin happened at the cross and the, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The others, I don't see an end to sin, do you? I, I'm still waiting for that one. I can't wait, but it hasn't happened. So we're saying, here's what we're saying. There's 70 sets of seven-year timelines, seven years, uh, uh, what do you call it? Things, things. When you don't know the word, just say things. There's 70 sets of seven years, and, and, and at the end of the 70th set, these things are going to be fulfilled. Okay? You see it? Does that make sense? Okay, I hope you got that. We got to get that. 490 years total, but the 70 sets of sevens play an important role here. Because now those 70 sets of sevens are divided. Divided into three basic groups. And the first is, there's going to be seven of them. Seven sets of seven, which is 49 years. You're looking at me like, just let me go back to sleep. I was having a good nap. So he says, Gabriel goes on, Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be, notice, seven sets of sevens, then 40, or or excuse me, 62 sets of sevens. Oh, yeah, this is fun, right? Try being in my shoes trying to explain it, okay? There is a 49-year period is what we're talking about. Seven sets of seven, seven times seven, 49, so 49 years. And then a 62 sets of seven-year period, 62 times seven, 434. So we got 49 years, 434 years. And that takes up how many sets of sevens? 69, okay? Because we got, we got 7 and 62, 69. Whew. Let me see if it shows up better on this chart. So here's this chart. This is a, I had a different chart that I was going to use, but it, it had so much more involved in it that I just tried to make it as simple as I possibly could. This is a chart that you can pick up at the back. And so what you will see is this starting over here to this line here is 69 weeks total of 483 years see it so that's what that's what gabriel's saying and that's going to be divided into two groups a seven set seven uh times seven 49 years and a 62 times seven 435 four years 
Okay, so we have this. But if you look back at the verse, when does this time period start, this 69 weeks? It says it starts at the decree that they can go back in and rebuild Jerusalem. We know that that happened at least four times in the Bible, four different times, starting with Cyrus and then also Artaxerxes, who, who said they could go a couple times. And, and so we know that it began at this certain date. In fact, one, one scholar has said it happened on March 14th, 445 B.C. Whoa! And I don't doubt him. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying he's wrong. I just haven't done the study. I don't know. But he knows the date. And he says this is when the decree went out. So what happened is there was a first set of seven, seven sevens, 49 years, and Ezra went in, and he rebuilt the temple. Nehemiah went in, he rebuilt the wall around Jerusalem, and then from then on, Jerusalem kept being rebuilt. Do you know how long it took after the time that Artaxerxes said they could rebuild Jerusalem? Do you know how long it took for it to be finished? 49 years. It's historical. You look it up. 49 years. Here's Gabriel before it even happened saying it's going to be seven sets of seven years. And, and here it is, 49 years, and it was finished. And then there is, uh, so here, here's, the, here's the rebuilding. And then there's 62 weeks where it says that this, this Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt. It's going to go through some troubled times. But notice at the end of this time, it says that the anointed one, a prince, will show up. That's what it says back there in verse 25. A prince, an anointed one. Do you know what anointed one means? Messiah. This is talking about the Messiah. Guess how long, I'm going to jump there, guess how long it took from the time that Artaxerxes decreed they could rebuild Jerusalem until that day when Jesus entered into Jerusalem, the newly built city, on a donkey. 483 years. God fulfills prophecy. 483 years, Jesus came riding in on a donkey, and guess what the people said as they were lined up on the road? Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Gabriel said, Messiah would show up. He's a prince or a king. And here they are shouting, here is the king. And so when, when uh, Gabriel continues, he says something else is going to happen. The anointed one, the Messiah is going to show up. He's going he's to come on the scene. And I believe that was at the, at the triumphant entry. But also now he says, and after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. So here, let me show you what happens. Jesus comes in. Five days later, he's put on the cross, and he is cut off. That term cut off in Daniel means to be executed. Literally to be pierced. He will be cut off. Jesus was cut off. And guess what? The city, and especially the temple, was destroyed in 70 AD, not too much longer after Jesus died and rose again. Oh, God fulfills his prophecy. And the whole point is this. When Jesus rode in that day on the donkey, something interesting happens. Jesus comes in, and the people are shouting, Hosanna, and you would think Jesus would be happy. They're recognizing me as their king, but we find him in Luke chapter 19, and he is crying. Why? Well, let's find out. And when he drew near, this is Jesus coming in on a donkey. When he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now... They are hidden from your eyes, which, let me just say, that implies they haven't been hidden from your eyes until now. Now they're hidden from your eyes. 
And he goes on and he says, For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. That happened in 70 A.D. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you. But look at this, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now I'm getting back to my point finally. Jesus comes riding in. And he doesn't let them escape their responsibility. You should have known this. Jesus is saying, you're responsible to know this. How, how would they know it? Daniel chapter 9. It's spelled out. The time is there for them. And Jesus is saying, you should have known the day of your visitation, but because you didn't, this is what's going to happen. That's why I say to us, we need to respond to prophecy with prayer and prepare. The Bible prophecy ought to propel us to prepare to prayer and prepare. And so Jesus didn't let them escape. And so what we need to know is this, and I'm going to go through this real fast, so it's on that chart, but let me show you. Verse 27 is about the 70th week. See, we had 69 sets of seven, right, years, but we're missing one. Where is that one? Well, I will tell you right up front, I believe it hasn't happened yet. That it's coming at a point when we don't know the time. I can't tell you when it's going to happen. But there is a time coming that is known as the tribulation. It's the 70th week of Daniel. And in verse 27, we are told that this one is going to come and he's going to make this great covenant with worldwide. It's a worldwide covenant. This this one is going to come, and guess who this one is? Remember who we looked at last week? The freakish, small little horn with eyes that sees like a human and a mouth that boasts great things. This is the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to come. He's going to set up, or she, could be a she, going to set up a, a, a covenant with the world. And the Antichrist is going to be amazing, full of wisdom, full of, full of knowledge. They're going to have a wonderful plan. People are going to be duped into following the Antichrist because everything looks amazing. And what we're told, though, is there's a seven-year covenant and in the middle of that seven-year covenant, at three and a half mark, things are going to go south. On top of that, God is, God's wrath is coming in, and, and, and there's earthquakes like we've never seen, all these things. You can read about it later, but the 70th week has yet to come. It's terrible. You don't want to be a part of it, trust me. I don't have time to get into it, but you don't want to be there. I've heard some people literally say, well, I'll just come to Jesus if the tribulation really happens. No, you don't want to be a part of that. Plus, what if you die before then? <laughs> I wouldn't take a chance. And so there's this tribulation that's coming. So we are in this age called the church age, the time of the Gentiles. And the next thing that's happening for us, I believe full well, is the rapture. So when we talk about prayer and prepare, I want to make sure today that you are prepared for the rapture. What is the rapture? The rapture is described for us in, in Matthew 24 by Jesus himself when the Lord comes and, and he gathers all of his saints, his elected ones, uh, from the four corners of the earth. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, Paul puts it this way. Paul says, therefore stay awake for you do not know... Uh, oh, that's Jesus, sorry. Oh, I missed it. Sorry, I went too far ahead. Here's what I'm looking for. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, Gabriel perhaps, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. I believe that's the next stage. Jesus says, you don't know. You don't know the time. You don't know the hour. He even said when he was on this earth, even he didn't know the day or the time in which that was going to happen. But the point is, we need to be prepared. Are you prepared? Are you prepared? 
See, the, the Bible tells us in Revelation that only those whose name is in the Lamb's book of life will be able to go there. Everybody else who's not, whose names are not there, they don't go. They don't go. In fact, they stay here for the tribulation and ultimately end up in hell. Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? And you say, well, Pastor, how, how does that happen? Well, you know, when you call for reservations for a restaurant... I'm not trying to be light of this. It's just like that. I call and I make reservations. Hey, I'd like to come have dinner at 5 (laughs) o'clock. See, the way that we get our name written in the Lamb's Book of Life is we make sure we we have reservations. And how do we do that? Through prayer. I want to tell you today, it's through prayer that you will prepare. In other words, you want to have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord. Make sure you have your name there because we don't know when it's going to happen. Could be today. Could be this afternoon. Could be in the next few minutes. Could be in the next few years. Could be in the next thousand years. I don't know. That's the whole point. But the point that Jesus makes is be ready for it to be now. And I want your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I want you to have that reservation. The way you do it is you pray. You use prayer to prepare. And so I'm going to ask you to lead or follow my lead in a prayer if you have not done this. I just want you to make sure your name is written there. So let's bow our heads, close our eyes. And if you want to make sure in your own heart and quietness, the Lord hears your heart, just say something like this to the Lord. Oh, dear Lord, thank you that you died on the cross for my sins and rose again on the third day. I praise you as the one who paid my debt. I admit I am a sinner separated from you. But today, I ask that you would write my name in your book of life. I put my full trust in you as the one who has died for me and risen again. I receive you into my heart and life. And I want to follow you. And dear friend, if you prayed that prayer, and we're sincere about it, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And so, Father, to that end, we give you praise and thanks that we don't have to pay for it, we don't have to earn it, we don't have to be good enough for our name to be written there, but that we just look to the cross of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and we are promised we become your kid. And so, Father, I pray and I thank you for anyone in this place today who has said that prayer And if that's you, just let me know. Would you let me know today if you prayed that prayer? I've got things I'd love to give to you to help you grow in what you have just done. But Father, we just give you praise and thanks that you've recorded these things for us that we might pray and prepare for the day that we don't know exactly when, but know that you will return. And we lift this up to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with us? Thinking about the future can be kind of scary. But we're not to have an attitude of, hey, mom and dad, when are you coming home? (laughs) I'll get ready right before. So we're going to make this song our prayer to be ready today. That he would build his kingdom with us that he would bring it down to us, that we would be representing it well, and that we would follow through with the high calling that he's given us to represent him, to be his presence on earth. So let's make this song our prayer. If you want to bow your head and close your eyes while we sing, you can. If you want to clap your hands, it's still our prayer to the Lord together. Let's sing.
increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. Your kingdom first, we hunger and we thirst, we refuse to waste our lives, for Lord our joy and prize, to see the captives' hearts release, the hurt, the sick, the poor at peace, we lay down our lives for heaven's cause. So we sing, build your kingdom here, let the darkness fear, show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land, set your church on fire, win this nation back, change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here. We pray. Unleash your kingdom's power. Reaching the near and far. No force of hell can stop. Your beauty changing hearts. You made us for much more than this. Awake the kingdom seed in us. Fill us with the strength and love of Christ. We are your church. We are the hope on earth. Let's pray this together. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mind. streets and land set your church on fire win this nation back change the atmosphere build your kingdom here build your kingdom here let the darkness fear show your mighty hand heal our streets and land set your church on fire and win this nation back change the atmosphere build your kingdom here we pray amen we pray that lord that you would do this we prepare our hearts we ask that you would prepare us to be ready for the day of your return. Help us not to be asleep, aloof, waiting without regard, but Lord, help us to be anticipating with great hope what you're going to come and do. We praise you, Jesus, and we ask for your kingdom to come in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next time.